I think. There we are. So for those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Lowell Bernhardt. I am one of the elders, and I get the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. If you're visiting with us, like Clara said, be sure you stop by Next Steps out front. We'd love to get to know you a little better. And if you're online uh, this morning, put something in the chat box. Let us know you're there. We'd love to get to know you there as well. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship in your house, and most of all, to lift the name of your son, Jesus, above all other names. Father, I pray and I ask that you would let this sermon be your sermon and that you would get me out of the way and that you would use your word to speak to the hearts in this room. Father, it's all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Who here has a father? Come on, nine o'clock. That wasn't a trick question. Everybody should raise their hand, okay? So let's, let's assume for a second that everybody raised their hand, okay? Because as we understand biology at this point in time, everyone here has a father. So whose dad has a dadism? You know, a saying that your dad says, usually at an inopportune time, it's usually some little snippet of truth buried in some wise thing that your dad thinks he's saying. And it usually elicits this response in your kids. <sighs> you know, think about it. Every dad has them. So just some of my dads, my dad always starts stories with a long, long time ago in a land far, far away. So much so that my wife repeats it whenever we talk about my dad. He also says, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time and don't start at the tail. My Uncle Danny has one. My Uncle Danny served as kind of like a father figure for a long time in my life. And he had one and his was, sometimes you just have to pick your nose. (laughs) That's a whole sermon series in and of itself. So we'll save that for another day. My father-in-law, his dadism would be common sense. It's something they just don't teach in school nowadays. (laughs) My personal favorites would be decisions have consequences. And second to that is, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. So, you know, I put this question out to Facebook, and I was blown away by how horrible we fathers are. A lot, of the, a lot of the comments I got back were, I can't put that on here. I can't put that on here. One of my good friends from high school actually says, I can't type that here. I'll get a violation. <laughs> so, you know, dadisms can be good and bad both. Some of the best ones that came in from Facebook were, a man is as only as good as his word. I'm solid. Don't date anyone you wouldn't want to marry. That's another one of my Uncle Danny's. I'll give you something to cry about. Who can relate to that one? <laughs> that, one's, that, that one's a good one. I'm sorry, I must use this stand last. I need to bring this up a little bit. All right. And my favorite from Facebook is don't confuse movement with progress. You know, a lot of these are truisms, adages, a, a snippet of truth with a little bit of wisdom that makes you think on the backside of it. We've got a lot of adages here in America. Things like, look before you, leap, Leap. there we go. A rolling stone gathers, no moss. moss. Uh, No good deed goes, see you guys are good at this. Hold your friends close, but hold your enemies. See, we're getting the hang of it. All dogs go to, except for chihuahuas. Today we start into the book of Proverbs, and I'm a little intimidated by this because I've never launched a sermon series before. Jay goes out of town and he leaves me at the reins. So Proverbs, I can get into Proverbs as a book, a wisdom book, and a poetic book, and all that, and it is that thing. But let's be honest, Proverbs is a book written by his dad, by a dad, for his son, because he wants to leave a legacy with his son. He wants to leave an instruction manual, if you will, full of truisms and little short statements. What is a proverb, you might ask? Before we talk about what a proverb is, let's talk about what a proverb isn't. You can get on the Google machine and type in and get all kinds of proverb sermons and they run the gamut. But if you're going to do that, let me give you a little bit of caution. Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not always 100% true. And Proverbs are not prophecies. There's a lot of disinformation out there. So just keep that in mind. So what is a proverb? All the commentaries that I've read almost use the same statement to a fault. They're short, pithy statements and truisms. See, You see, the the word proverb comes from the Latin proverbium. Proverbium literally means a word put forward or a common saying, an adage like we just talked about. Dr. Michael Heiser puts it this way, they're not intended to be instructions, but rather short, 
thought-provoking sayings that cause the reader to ponder and apply the truths found there to their own lives. So let's set up some background for Proverbs. Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon wrote Proverbs. So who is Solomon? Chapter one, verse one of Proverbs says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Who is Solomon? The wisest man to have ever lived on earth. Turn with me, if you will, and if you want to grab one of the Bibles in the seat in front of you, I didn't call them pew Bibles, to the seat in front of you, turn to page 290. We're going to start with 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to read verses 5 through 15. And this talks about how Solomon received his wisdom. And it says, starting in verse 5, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, Ask, what should I give you? And Solomon replied, You have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne, as it is today. Lord, my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet, I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, because you have requested this as you did, as, and you did not ask for a long life or riches for yourself or death to your enemies, but you asked discernment for yourself to administer justice. I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you wise and under, I, I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that you, I apologize, so that there is, so that there has never been anyone like you before or never will be again. In addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no king will be your equal during your entire life. If you walk in the ways and keep the statutes and commands, just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. So imagine, if you will, you wake up from a dream, and the Lord's there, and he says, what should I give you? You know, a lot of us would default to riches, fame, glory, things like that. Solomon asked for wisdom. And God honored that because Solomon didn't ask for those things. He asked for wisdom. I'm not there. God asked me what I want. Wisdom's probably not gonna be my answer. Patience might be. Wisdom probably wouldn't be, but there's, there's a whole gamut of things. So Solomon's wisdom was great. And if we continue reading on in, in chapter, if we continue reading on in chapter three, we hear of the first instance of Solomon displaying his wisdom. And it's two women and a baby. These two women happen to be prostitutes and they give birth to babies in the same week. And one of the prostitutes rolls over and falls asleep on the baby and it kills the baby. So there's this baby shuffling that goes on. They move the live baby back and forth and there's this fight over whose baby it is. Whose baby is this? So they go before Solomon and these women are back and forth. It's my baby, it's my baby, it's my baby. And Solomon says, guard, bring a sword. Let's cut the baby in half. Give each of them half, problem solved. And all of a sudden, one of the women's like, no, 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 no. Give the baby to her. And Solomon says, give the baby to the woman who said, give it away. Because we all know no mother would want to watch their child be cut in half. It's things like that that the Lord gave Solomon. It's the wisdom, the discernment, the ability to see the good and the bad and the evil and the injustice. Along with the book of Proverbs, Solomon also wrote Ecclesiastes in the Song of Solomon. As we go through the Proverbs, you'll find that there's Proverbs about wisdom and folly, money and work habits, marriage and relationship, the consequences of hanging out with the wrong crowd, and the consequences of hanging out with the right crowd, and how to have a healthy fear of the Lord. So Proverbs mentions a lot knowledge and wisdom. And you may be thinking this morning, so knowledge and wisdom, aren't they the same thing? Yes and no. So think about it this way. Everybody knows that person who's wicked smart. You know, like PhD level rocket scientist guy who does long form linear algebra in his head just for fun because he thinks it's it's something neat. We all know the person, but let's be honest. As they walk away, we can't help but wonder who tied their shoes. 
They, they, they just, they can't carry on. They can't, they have lots of book smarts. They have lots of knowledge, but their deliverables are kind of lacking sometimes. So that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. My dad has a saying, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. That's an application of the two. <clears throat> so as we start this morning, we're going to read the first seven verses of Proverbs. So if, if you will, turn in, your, turn in your Bible to page 755, and we're going to start in. I'm reading this morning from the ESV because I think the ESV unclutters a lot of the language that's in a lot of the translations. It, it breaks it down in a more word-for-word format. So I'm going to read through these first seven verses, and then we're going to go back and break them down one at a time. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's go back through that and break that down. Verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon is the son of David first, who happens to be the king of Israel. You see, Solomon leans back into that legacy that he's been handed, that bloodline, that lineage, because his audience of the time understood things in those terms, because he was the son of David, who happened to be the king of Israel. As we go through verses two through seven, we find an instruction manual on how to use the book, the book of Proverbs. Could you imagine if we had an instruction manual for all of the other books of the Bible? How much easier that would make digesting some of those books? Imagine Romans with a instruction manual for the first couple chapters. Instead, what do we get from Paul? Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now you freak, sit down and hush up. Here's what, you do, here's what you're doing wrong. That's the way most of Paul's letters start. They don't come with an instruction manual. So let's, let's read through this instruction manual, starting in verse two. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let's stop there. In verses two through four is the first time we see coming into play this theme of the simple and the youth. Solomon writes this this book to that crowd. You see, you can be simple-minded and you can be a youth and not be a fool. Throughout Proverbs, Solomon plays on this theme of simple-mindedness or in wisdom and folly. He plays them back and forth in a lot of the Proverbs. But as we read through here, in verse three, I wanna point something out and I wanna be sure that we don't read it in a 21st century context. When you read the Bible, we need to be sure that we read it in context for the audience that it was written when it was written and where it was written. So verse three says, to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. We have to be careful that when we read that, we don't read into that righteousness, justice, and equality because of the news that goes on today. You see, equity is the ability to stand flat-footed on even ground before the courts with everyone else. Equality is not the same. R.C. Sproul says, equity meant that everybody received what was their due Not everybody received things in terms of material possessions equally. Let's just be sure we have that in the right context and we keep that in mind as we read through Proverbs. And another thing we want to keep in mind is that the readers of Proverbs, when it was written, didn't have the New Testament to work as a filter for what's there. Moving on to verse five. Let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance. This is the first time that Solomon mentions the wise. You see, in verse five, he lays out how the wise behave. They hear and increase in learning, and they understand, and they obtain guidance. You see, wise people aren't afraid to go ask for help. Wise people tend to be more humble. They will go ask for help. They'll ask for guidance. They'll put in the work to do what they need to do in order to understand things. In verse six, he's still speaking to the wise. It says, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. You see, the wise will use their learning and their guidance to understand riddles and words of the wise, difficult sayings. Many commentators refer to proverbs as words of the wise. Chapters one through nine are a lot of that. But if you think about that, 
riddles. We see what a riddle is, but literally that means dark sayings, things that are hard to understand, things that you have to chew on to understand, things that, like adages, have a small snippet of truth, but you have to figure out and work through how to make that a reality in your life. In verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the first mention of fools in the book of Proverbs. Solomon plays fools and the wise back and forth a lot. But we're gonna camp out on the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. For many, many years, I read that as I have to be afraid of the Lord in order to understand what he wants for me. Now, there is some side of truth to that. We should fear the Lord. But as I was preparing for this sermon, I had an Inugo Montoya moment. Any Princess Bride fans? <laughs> okay, good, good. There's more, there's more Princess Bride fans than there are people who have dads. So, you know, they go across the lake and they reach the cliffs of insanity. And Andre the Giant carries Princess Buttercup, Vincente, and Inugo to the top of the cliffs of insanity. And they get to the top and... The Dread Pirate Roberts was clinging to the rocks after they cut the rope to knock him back down. And Vincente looks over the edge and says, inconceivable. And Inugo looks at him and goes, you keep saying that word, but I do not think it means what you think it means. The fear of the Lord is one of those instances, church. I read that as I need to be afraid of God to understand what he's talking about. But there's so much more to that. Let's see if we can break this down by seeing what scripture has to say. Turn with me to page 23 in your Bible. We're gonna read Genesis 28, 10 through 17. This is the story of Jacob's ladder. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haram. Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place and put it at his head. And lay down in that place. And he dreamed a stairway was set on the ground with his top reaching the sky, and God's angels were coming up and going down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I want to pause there for a second. In Genesis 31 42, God is referred to as the fear of Isaac. The God of Isaac, the fear of of Isaac. Moving on. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you're lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out toward the west and the east, the north and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will, and will watch, over, watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, what an awesome place is this. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The word in verse 17 that says he was afraid can be translated as reverent. So let's read that again, just let it sink in for a second. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And he was reverent. Doesn't sound like fear, like I understand it. It's beginning to take a different shape, look a little different. Turn with me now to Psalm chapter 19, uh, verse seven. It's page uh, 480 in, in your, in the Pew Bible. There, I did it again. As we go to Psalm, Psalm 19 is largely written about the word. It's written about our understanding of scripture itself. So in Psalm 19, it says, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. As we go through this section, we notice seven characters, character traits of God in the glory that is due him because of them. In verse seven, 
he's perfect and trustworthy. In verse eight, he's right and radiant. In verse nine, he's pure, reliable, and righteous. But if you notice, tucked into verse nine, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. In that character, that list of character traits of God, we find the fear of the Lord tucked in among it. It's pure. It's holy. Let's turn to Jeremiah 33, verses 8 and 9. It's page 702. This is the second word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah regarding Israel's restoration. Starting in verse 8, it says, I will purify them from all iniquity they have committed against me. And I will forgive all the iniquities they have committed against me, rebelling against me. This city will bear on my behalf a name of joy, praise, and glory before the nations of the earth. Who will bear all, <clears throat> who will bear all of the prosperity I will give them? They will tremble with awe because of all the good and all the peace I will bring about to them. That word awe in verse 9 can also be translated fear. Awe, the fear of the Lord. You see, this section lays out five different blessings. In those five different blessings, it doesn't seem like something that you should be afraid of, does it? It kind of gives you the context for the fear of the Lord. They trembled with fear because of all the blessing, because of all the good. I know in our 21st century mentality, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense because fear to us means one thing, but you have to do the work and you have to get around that mental block to understand what the fear of the Lord looks like. Commentator Al Martin puts it this way, the essential ingredients of the fear of God are correct concepts of the character of God, a pervasive sense of the presence of God and a constant awareness of our obligation to God. The essential ingredients of the fear of God are correct concepts of the character of God. As we just read in Psalms, to name a few, perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, reliable, and righteous. In a pervasive sense of the presence of God, Jacob knew that God was in that place. Can you imagine being there, church, putting yourself in that situation? How awe-inspiring that would be and a constant awareness of our obligation to God. Midwestern Seminary, Professor Michael Reeves puts it this way, true fear of God is the love of God defined. Let that sink in for a second. The love of God defined. Church, what does the love of God mean to you? How do we exhibit that? How do we reflect that? And a lot of you are thinking, well, you've just spent 20 minutes rambling on about this. What's the logical application of this? Could you not laugh when I say that? <laughs> the, the logical explanation of this is found in chapter two of Proverbs. Just like any dad, you never tell, tell your kid, hey, can you go do X, Y, Z without giving specific instructions on what X, Y, Z looks like, right? Because it's, you're destined for disaster. If you don't, you'll end up with your flower beds mulched over the flowers, things like that. You have, to, you have to give instructions. So turn with me to page 555. We're gonna start in chapter two of Proverbs. And I'm gonna read through it and then we'll go back through it and break it down. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as, as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Let's break this down. Be cognizant as you read if-then statements. Any computer programmers here? Anybody? A couple. Okay, good, good. If-then statements. If something happens, then the next thing, the next thing happens. Last time I preached, we talked about this as we were looking at the, the Old Testament law and if you do this, then this. If you do this, or this, then this. So there's instruction here. Be on the lookout for the word if. So let's start into this. Verse one, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Point number one, the fear of the Lord requires that we make his wisdom 
our own wisdom through time in the word. Through time in the word. And I don't mean three and a half minutes reviewing the verse of the day in the Bible app. Not that that's a bad thing, but that doesn't check this box, church. In verse two, it says, make your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Inclining your heart to understanding implies that you're hungry for this. You're ready to do the work and you're ready to receive that knowledge and instruction that the wise take to heart and use it to grow themselves. Tim Keller in his book, God's Wisdom for Navigating Life, says this about how the word should shape and influence every aspect of our daily lives. It says, either God's word will be the unquestioned arbiter of truth or something else will serve that function. Public opinion, your own feelings, a scientific mindset. Either God and your relationship with him will be the one thing you esteem the most every or, and every, every single other thing will be evaluated in light of that or your relationship with some other thing will define your reality. Either your relationship with Christ will be your defining characteristic or something else will be. We're always looking for some kind of treasure. We're always looking for some kind of treasure. What we fear says a lot about what we treasure. Our fears often drive our behaviors. So church, what are you afraid of? being sinful or being uncomfortable? Being a sinner or being exposed as a sinner? Do you mainly refrain from sin because you're afraid of the consequences of sin? The consequences of being caught in sin? Or do you refrain from sin because it grieves a holy, righteous God? Are you afraid of God and his opinion of you or people's opinion of you? I struggle with that one, church. I don't behave immorally, but I tend to worry about what people think. Anybody else here relate? Moving on, verse three. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice to understanding. This brings us to point two. The fear of the Lord requires time spent in prayer. You have to seek this. You have to spend the time in prayer. You have to be willing to call out for understanding. And you have to incline your heart and be ready to receive that guidance and that instruction when it comes back. Verse four, if you seek it like silver and search for it as in hidden treasure. Point three, is the fear of the Lord means you have to put in some effort. You have to do some work. Where the rubber meets the road, you have to be willing to dig in. You have to be willing to spend your time. You see, there's two different verbs used in this, in this text. Seek and search. Seek identifies the position of your heart. Do you desire it? Is it something you're wanting to go after? Is it something that you long for? And then to search is where the rubber meets the road. You have to get out and you have to do the work. You have to put in the time. You have to spend time in the word. You have to spend time in prayer and you have to be willing to do it. Last week, Jacob in his sermon, and by the way, if you haven't listened to Jacob's sermon last week online, what are you waiting for? Was a great sermon. He did a great job. So I stole this from him. Jacob said last week, trusting God means surrendering your need to know why and faithfully doing things that might only make sense in reverse. Let me read that again. Trusting God means surrendering your need to know why and faithfully doing things that only make sense in reverse. Church, I have to tell you, if you're going to have a healthy fear of the Lord, you're going to have to do things that don't make sense. You can't spend time in this book and on your knees and not fix things in your life. None of us is perfect. There was only one who was perfect and thank God he was because I'm not. But you have to do the things that don't make sense. This dusty old book is going to show you things that you're going to have to change. People you're going to have to stop talking to because they're toxic. Websites you're going to have to start going, you're going to have to stop going to 
and websites you're going to have to start going to. The fear of the Lord requires the work. And I'm not saying that we use that as a way to earn our salvation or to earn favor with God, but it requires work. Nothing worth having comes easy. Verse five, then, there's the, there's the then. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. After you do these things, after you spend time in the word, after you pray and call out for insight, humble your heart and ask and seek, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Speaking to HUD this morning, he, he, made, he made the point of a healthy fear of the Lord. And I think when I started this sermon, I was on the other side. I was on the side that thought, you know, I have to be afraid of God in order to get this right. And yes, there is a, there is a piece of that in this. But the fear of the Lord is so much more. It is the reflection of our love of God to the world around us. It is that last piece of the puzzle. So as I begin to close and I ask the band to come back up, I started this discussion this morning talking about legacy and talking about how Proverbs is a book written by a dad for his kids. A dad who humbly walked and exuded that fear of the Lord every day so his kids could see it. And as anybody who's been in church for a while knows, every good, every good minister has to have a three-point sermon. Well, I found point four as I was looking for somewhere to close. I don't have a slide for it. Second Corinthians 5, starting in verse 11, it says, Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your consciences. Therefore, since we have the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people. Church, point number four is the fear of the Lord requires it to be shared and passed on. We're obligated to share that and to tell other people. That love that we have gives us the ability to share that with other people and we're obliged to, to pass it on, that legacy. I told myself I wasn't gonna cry this morning. My mic just went out, I think. I'm not sure sure what happened. All right. Hello, there we go. All right. I told myself I wasn't gonna cry when I got up here this morning. I'll be honest, church. Past couple weeks, been kind of trying for me. I watched my oldest graduate from high school. My youngest move into the high school. I'm a blessed man. My kids are amazing. My wife is more like Jesus than anybody that I know but I've had a hard time thinking about legacy. Have I done enough? Have I met the obligation of the fear of the Lord being prevalent enough in my life to pass it on? Lean into that church. You know, there's people here this morning who are probably thinking, well, I didn't have, I don't, I don't have a legacy. I don't, I don't understand any of that. And don't misunderstand me. My legacy is two words, Jesus Christ. That's what I want. Someday I want my kids to stand around my grave and say, my old man screwed a lot of things up. But he loved Jesus. And he did his level-headed best to show me that. He did his level-headed best to walk in the fear of the Lord. 
And I'm not saying this, I'm, I'm not saying this to be proud, church. This is heavy, this is hard on me. But if you're here this morning and you say, there's so much in my past that I can't, I, I, I can't undo. Let me give you some encouragement. This book of Proverbs, the author of Proverbs wrote Proverbs and the only reason the author of Proverbs existed was because of an adulterous relationship with a married woman that his father had. Church, God's not afraid of your mess. He can take your mess and build a kingdom on top of it, but it's a kingdom for his glory, not for your glory. 12 generations before Solomon wrote Proverbs, the God was Isaac's fear. 11 generations before Solomon wrote Proverbs, Jacob was in awe of the fear of the Lord. Solomon's father in Psalms 111.10 wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and all those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Church, there is enough time to build a legacy on one generation. One generation can change the world. How are you going to pass that on and what is it going to look like? Is it going to look like the fear of the Lord? Is your legacy gonna say Jesus Christ or is it going to say one of these other things? Time in the word, prayer, and passing it on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this church and what you're allowing it to be. Father, I just, I pray and I ask that you would move in this place this morning, that you would convict hearts and open minds. Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the fact that his legacy will reign after we're all gone. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.